Good morning. Welcome to Pathfinder Church. Let's stand up. Let's worship the Lord together. Let's sing. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper, Light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Welcome to Pathfinder Church, and welcome to this time of worship. And as we come here before God to worship Him, we're reminded by the words that we just sang, and that is that God is here. God is here. He's moving in our midst, and we are here to worship Him today. And we're called to worship today with these words from Psalm 118. It says this, This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. You see, for a lot of us, a lot of the time, we don't spend a lot of time living in today. We spend a lot of time with our thoughts in the past or in the future, thinking about yesterday, thinking about last week, or maybe something that happened earlier this morning, or we're thinking about what's going to happen after the service today, or next week, or maybe next year, and maybe it's anticipation, maybe it's worry. But we spend so little time actually in the moment today. But God says that today is the day that he made. And this hour right now is the chance for us to be together and to be in God's presence. So I invite you, I invite all of us to be present here in the moment. 
I invite us to be engaged in worship for the next hour. To not think about the past, to not think about the future, but to simply be here. Be here with God. Be here with God's people as we continue to worship him. If you're joining us online, please leave a comment below and worship with us. Let's go before God. Worship him together. One, two, three. Faithfulness, O oh God, you wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters and to mercy, and nothing can keep us apart.
Please have a seat. Good morning, everybody. I am here with what you need to know about the life of this church. Got a few things to tell you about. And first, I think we're going to start out with a video. So let's check it out. I'm Kathy Lee Gifford coming to you from beautiful, beautiful Jerusalem, Israel. Thank you for joining us. We're going to take you on a trip of a lifetime in the next six sessions. My friend Rabbi Jason Sobel and I are going to open up the scriptures for you. We're going to take you all around Israel. We're going to get you out of that pew on Sunday morning. We're going to get you out of Sunday school. And we are going to take you out of Grandma's Bible study. And we are going to rock your world with what you're going to learn from the original Hebrew in the Old Testament to the original Greek in the New Testament. The scriptures are going to come alive to you as we realize what the Bible really says. There have been so many bad translations of the Bible and it's caused so much confusion around the world. We've got to get back to what the Bible originally said in order to understand it, in order to apply it to our lives today. So come with us for the rock, the road, and the rest. All right. The Rock, the Road, and the Rabbi uh, Bible Study starts today at 3 p.m. It's led by Brother Don and Miss Jackie. Uh, there uh, is a book that you can acquire <laughs> if you don't already have it for this study. If you have questions, talk to Brother Don, who you'll meet in a few minutes, or uh, Miss Jackie, and they can help you out. All right. Our next uh, announcement is about our Moms to Mom sale coming up in just a few weeks. Uh, for those of you that have littles who have outgrown their things, we still have a few spots where you can uh, rent a space and sell those outgrown clothes and maybe get some new deals for your kiddos. Uh, we are looking for volunteers for this event. Just a reminder that our church blesses anyone who's in the uh, kindergarten through 12th grade with $100 to attend a retreat or a camp of their choice that's church-related. Uh, and in order to fund that account, we have to do some fundraising. So this, this fundraising 
fundraiser is to supplement our camp scholarship program. So uh, we are looking some for some volunteers for both Friday night, um, I think starting around 6.30, or not necessarily for the whole day on Saturday, but certainly for a chunk of it, we would love your help. So if you are available and willing to help serve, um, please talk to myself, Pastor Jake, or any of the staff, we can help you out with that. Um, this is, again, one of our biggest fundraisers for our camp scholarship program, so we need lots of help putting it on. And last but not least, just a reminder that the first of our vaccine clinics starts this week, February 23rd, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, they are accepting registrations. You can go to our church website or there's a QR code out at the Connect desk. Um, and Or you can just walk in during that time. Um, they will have all of the available vaccines available for you. So if you're just looking for a booster or a pediatric, you can get all of those things. And there's more information on the website as well. Let's continue with our worship service, which means that I just switch hats <laughs> for today. <laughs> so I don't have any props. Sorry. Oh, nobody else is sad that I don't have props. Pastor Jake is sad. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to share with the congregation, maybe not all of you know, that Pastor Jake and I just got home from a winter retreat with our third through, uh, we had seventh graders uh, up through eighth grade um, out at Wesley Woods Camp over the last week. We had 10 children with us, and we had an amazing time. We talked about being difference makers. So it kind of applies to what I talked about last week and the fact that when we, sh how do we show that we are Jesus to the outside world, right? So I, the, one of the questions during chapel last night was, what 10 ways can you make a difference for your community, for your school, for your family? So we talked about ways, the group that I had, we talked about ways that we could make small differences. So maybe it's just sending a quick text to a friend that pops into your mind. Maybe it's sharing a smile with somebody as you're walking down the hallway at school. Maybe it's, I don't know, writing a note to a grandparent that you haven't seen in a while. All those things make a difference for Jesus, right? Then we talked about bigger ways to make a difference for Jesus. And that was a little harder to think about. We were talking about Jesus' miracles and the miracle at Cana where he turned water into wine. And we talked about some of the other miracles that Jesus did and how those were big differences. Well, that's amazing. Some of the kids were talking about if I could perform a miracle, I want to make sure nobody is hungry. Well, then how do you do that when you're only 12? How do I do that at my age? I'm not telling you how old I am. Hmm. How do we do that? Maybe it's a ripple effect. Today, the kids downstairs are going to learn about the miracle of feeding 5,000 people. And maybe it's a ripple effect. One person shares their lunch, so the next person shares their lunch, and so on and so forth. Something to think about. So I challenge you today and throughout this week, look for those 10 simple ways that you can share Jesus. And then start thinking about how you can make a bigger impact beyond that. So that's my children's moment for today. If you want to see more pictures, I can certainly share them, and hopefully we'll have some, a video for you next week, but it wasn't quite ready yet. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Like Christina said, she and I took a group of our students to winter camp at Wesley Woods this past weekend, and we had an amazing time. I see a couple tired faces out here today, mine included. But what we talked about for this weekend, our theme was how Jesus is a difference maker. And then we were each in challenge that, that we can be difference makers just like Jesus was too. And as we head into our offering time today, I just want to say that each and every one of you is a difference maker. You are a difference maker in your community. You're a difference maker in here. And you make a difference in the lives of the people sitting next to you and that are all around you. We are challenged to be difference makers and we're challenged to offer up ourselves not only to God, but to each other to make a difference for the kingdom. Let's pray together. Jesus, you are amazing and you are the ultimate difference maker. Jesus, we thank you so much that, that you love us just as we are, that you meet us right where we are. But you love us enough to not leave us as we are. You love us enough to, 
to, to challenge us to grow, to grow closer to you, to step out of our comfort zone and to, to love the people next to us, even though that might make us feel weird and uncomfortable sometimes. And Jesus, we thank you so much that, that you meet us in this place. We know that you're here and that you're moving. And I just pray that you give us the ears to hear you and open our hearts to how you're moving in our lives. Please help us to be courageous enough to step into what you're calling us to do. Jesus, we love you so much, and we thank you that you are walking among us and that you love us. Please speak to us now in this time, in this space, and help us to leave forever changed and transformed by your love. We love you, Jesus. Amen. So we are several weeks into this sermon series, and if you've been with us for the past few weeks, you know that this is the time where we look at a verse from the book of Zechariah, and we're going to do that again today as well. Zechariah 8, verse 12. Let's say these words together. For I am planting seeds of peace and prosperity among you. The grapevines will be heavy with fruit, the earth will produce its crops, and the heavens will release the dew. Once more, I will cause the remnant in Judah and Israel to inherit these blessings. We're going to sing this together. Join with us. Two, three, four. For I am planting seeds of peace and prosperity among you. The grapevines will be heavy with fruit. The earth will produce its crops. And the heavens will release its Good morning, beloved. Try that again. Good morning, beloved. Good morning. Oh, there you are. All right. And good morning to you all who are watching us online this morning. And good morning or good afternoon or good evening or whatever it happens to be when you will be watching us online later on this week. Uh, we're grateful to have all of you, and we greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are the remnant. That's what we've been talking about now. This is the sixth week, believe it or not, we've been talking about we are the remnant. And this week's uh, title is this, Only a Few Respond. Only a Few Respond. And I'm taking that from a Luke passage, uh, Luke chapter 13. Uh, but first, I'm going to uh, intro it with uh, Mark 1, 15. So let's take a look at this text first. This is uh, Jesus talking now. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. So that's Jesus talking, and we'll, we'll talk more about that in just a minute. And then jumping into Luke chapter 13, verses 22 through 27, listen to this. Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he went, always pressing on toward Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? And he replied, work hard to enter the narrow door to God's kingdom. For many will try to enter, but will fail. When the master of the house has locked the door, it will be too late. You will stand outside knocking and pleading, Lord, open the door for us. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. And then you will say, but, but we ate and we drank with you and, and you taught in our streets. And he will reply, I tell you, I don't know who you or where you come from. Get away from me, all you who do evil. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Yeah, maybe, I think, for that word. That's a tough word, Mary. We're going to talk about it. So the theme for today that we take out of this is God calls us, but only a few respond. God calls us, but only a few respond. And since this is the, the last week of our sermon series, 
um, the second to the last week of our sermon series, I thought it would be appropriate for us to, to have a little reminder of where we've been over these last several weeks. And so the first week, we, we witnessed how God always produces or preserves a righteous and obedient, that was, those were the key words, righteous and obedient remnant of his people, and we, and we saw that through the life of Noah. And, and then the second week, we discovered how God can use unusual circumstances, and that was our word, words for those days. Even those that were meant for evil, God could use those to preserve his remnant, and we saw this through the eyes of Joseph, of course. Three weeks ago, we were privy to the idea that no matter how insignificant the size of the remnant, how few people there are in the remnant, the remnant is very significant for the mission of God in this world. So an insignificant in size, but majorly significant in purpose. And the prophet Amos was our guide in that insight. Two weeks ago, we learned that we are the holy seed of God's people in the world, called to proclaim the message of God, whether or not it appears anyone else is listening. And Isaiah was our encourager for that theme. Last week, we learned that God is regathering his remnant, and nothing can stop them from engaging the world. The remnant is set free, and it's empowered, and it's fearless because the remnant puts its trust in God and God alone. And the prophets Micah and Zephaniah gave us these images. So this week, we finally jump into the New Testament. We've, we've been in the Old Testament now for the first several weeks. This week, we finally get to the New Testament. And I want you to know, dear friends, uh, just in case you go looking for it, the word remnant does not show up in the New Testament, at least not in the New Living Translation. That I looked all through the New Living Translation, and, and the word remnant doesn't show up. But the concept of a remnant can be found all through the book's of the New Testament. And so authors use words and phrases something like this. Look at Romans 11, 5 here, for example. A few of the people of Israel have remained faithful. A few. That's a remnant, folks. And so that's what he's talking about here. That's what Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 11. So just to give you an idea. So while the word may not show up, the concept certainly is there. And again, I want to use a metaphor uh, to examine this text that I hope will help us to understand uh, what Jesus is really trying to say to us through Luke in, in what we just read here. So as you know, last week was the Super Bowl. Anybody watch the Super Bowl, actually watch it? Oh, yeah, a whole bunch. Okay, good, good. good. I, I, I enjoyed the game personally. Um, I'm glad that Matt Stafford got to, to win a Super Bowl. I was happy for him after suffering all those years here in Detroit. Um, so I was grateful for that. Um, but I really, truly didn't care who won because I, I I'm a fan of both teams. But, but anyway, uh, I was glad Maddie got it. Anyhow, so I, I want to step off of that visual that Miss Christina gave to us last week in her children's message. You remember she talked about getting all dressed up in, in our favorite fan garb of our favorite team and maybe painting our face. And, you know, some people take their shirts off and they paint their, their chests and, 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 and wearing all the right stuff and having their little. So, so I want to step off from that. And I want to just, for just a minute, I want to pull out some stuff I've got here behind the podium. This is my, um, this is my Western Michigan Broncos uh, um, uh, jersey right here. I just wanted to show you that. I'm not going to put that on because I'm wearing my suit coat. But... Um, I do have some other things that, that I can put on. I got, so I got this, this here. It, and if you don't like that one, I, I've got this one here. And, and, and if you don't like, oop, can't get it in my, can't get it in my microphone here. And if you don't like that one, I got this one. And then, and I got, and I got this. Showing my true colors. And then I got these. I mean, I can get all decked out. I couldn't find my foamy hand. I know we have one in the house, but I couldn't find it. But I got my, my Detroit Tigers gloves on. Hi, Ron. How you doing? Thanks for taking a picture of me looking like an idiot. Appreciate that. I, anyway, I got, I got all this stuff on. I, I got all dressed up. And you'll remember that she talked about getting dressed up in the garb of our favorite team. And, and, and you know, like I said, doing all those things and hat, jersey, the whole works. 
And, and then, so, so then what I do is I run down onto the field. Now, I'm, I'm up in the stands, right, because I'm a fan, and I'm dressed up like a fan. And I run down into the stands, out of the stands, and I run down onto the field, and I run up to the head coach. I say, hey, coach, put me in. I'm ready to play. That's, that's what I tell him. I'm, I'm ready to play. Put me in. I'm looking. I get all the garb. I'm ready to go. And he looks at you kind of strangely, and he says, who are you? I, I don't recognize you at all. I, I know all my players. I know my D-line. I know my offense. I know the quarterback. I know the running backs. I know, I know the O-line. I know the special teams. I know my kickers. I, I know everybody on this team. I don't know you. You've not been on the field during the practices you're not engaged in all the locker room meetings and planning that we do. You haven't watched the films. You've not done the same things on the field that, that all these other guys out here, all these players have been doing. You might be an invested fan, but you have not been in the game. I don't know you. And then the coach does the unthinkable, Mary. Security, come get this guy off my field. And they escort you off the field with the coach saying to you, I don't know you. I don't know where you're from. And off you go. What does God have to say about this? Well, it starts with the universal call to humanity. The big word, perhaps the most important word in our vocabulary, the word repent. It comes from Mark chapter 1, verse 15. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Come be on the team. This is Jesus' clarion call to all of Judea and by extrapolation, all of us today. He spoke these words right after he was baptized by John in the Jordan River and, and right after his little jaunt out into the wilderness to face Satan and all the testing. He came back and he, the first thing he said after all of that were these words. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Now, I could have used several other examples of this uh, to make this point. Um, Peter says it. Paul says it. John says it. You know, John the Baptist says it. There's, I mean, all kinds of different people. But, but this invitation comes directly from Jesus. I used it because it's the very first words we have recorded of Jesus as he starts his ministry. Now, it's, it's not the first words we see it from Jesus in the Bible. And we see the whole thing when he's 12 years old in the temple and he talks to his parents and he says, didn't you know I had to be at my father's house and all that. But these are the first words that Jesus speaks at the beginning of his teaching, preaching ministry. Right at the very beginning. And I use the Gospel of Mark because it's the first recorded gospel there is. Mark wrote it first. Everybody else followed and so the team is being formed, says Jesus. Repent of your sins. Declare Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Not just Savior, but Lord. Where that obedience word comes in and righteousness word comes in as well. Lord and Savior. And join the team. The good news is the proclamation of God's action in this world the coming of God's kingdom into this world. It's manifested by the ministry and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And so Jesus invites us to come be part of the team. So let's talk about this word repent for a moment. The word in the Greek is metanoia. Metanoia, there it is, in the Greek and in English. It's usually translated repent. 
It literally, physically means to turn around, to do a 180-degree turn. So if you're, walking, if you're walking in a direction, it literally means to make a 180-degree turn and come face something new. And in this case, in, in the ideal of repentance, it's coming to face with God. It is a change of mind and mindset so repentance is not just a feeling of regret. A lot of people think it's, that's what it is. It's a feeling of regret. And, and I'm sure there are feelings of regret in, in that, but repentance isn't that. It's, it's a change of mind. It's an ordering of one's life in such a way as to be acceptable to God. That is being in God's will for your life. Paul says it another way. It's, the, it's this, having the same mind that was in Christ Jesus in you. It's a change of mind, a change of heart. And it requires a response on our part to become part of the team. You see, it, grace is offered, but we have to respond. And so the second thing I want you to hear out of this comes from, again, just directly from Jesus' mouth. Okay, these are Jesus' words. Respond. He replied, work hard to enter the narrow door to God's kingdom, for many will try to enter but will fail. Now, Jesus and, and his entourage, you know, they're heading towards Jerusalem. Jesus is always looking to get to Jerusalem. He's heading towards Jerusalem, and he's teaching along the way, and he's teaching the, those that were following him. So not just his 12, but, but several other people that are following along as well. And he's teaching, and, he's, he, and he begins um, chapter 13 of, of, of Luke by teaching about making a genuine change in your life, a genuine change in your life. And, and he does that verses 1 through 9. So I encourage you to go back and, and read this later on in your next steps for today. Read the entire chapter uh, of 13. He's teaching about making genuine changes in your life. And then he conducts a healing on the Sabbath in a synagogue. Oh my goodness, how dare he do that? He conducted a healing, Jake, on the Sabbath. And that was against the rules. But Jesus said, listen, <laughs> show some compassion rather than blindly following rules. And so he teaches that in that moment, verses 10 through 17. And then he begins to teach on the kingdom of God. And he's talking about how you can compare what the kingdom of God would look like. And, and he talks about the kingdom of God being like a mustard seed, you know, that tiny little seed that grows up into the great big shrub that it does so that the birds of the air can be a part, you know, can nest in it. And he talks about yeast. He compares the kingdom to yeast and where, you know, just a tiny little bit of yeast you know, goes through the whole loaf. And then finally, as he's teaching, that's, that's verses 18 through 21, by the way. Finally, as he's teaching and they're walking on, someone gets brave enough to ask a question. And he walks over to the Lord and he says, Lord, will only a few be saved? Will only a few be saved? And Jesus' answer is what we just read and he turns his teaching to personal responsibility. So he's been teaching about all these things, and now he wants to shift to personal responsibility. We don't know why the question was asked, uh, presumably maybe in response to Jesus' teachings about the kingdom of God. Uh, some commentaries that I read suggested that this was a common question and debate amongst many of the rabbis of Jesus' day. And so you know, here's an individual coming up to find out what one more rabbi's opinion is on this. Will, will only a few be saved or will, you know, will everybody be saved? Will everybody be able to join the team or, or only a few? So the first thing that strikes me about his answer is the words work hard. Jesus started off his answer with work hard. What, is, what does Jesus mean by work hard? I mean, I thought salvation was a free gift from God. So why would we have to work for it? And the hint comes uh, from the original Greek word, and here it is uh, up on the board there for you. Look at that. Huh. Agonizio. Agonizio. What does that sound like, guys? What does it sound like? Yeah, agonize. Agonize. That's where we get our word agonize from, agonizio. 
We get it from that. It's to agonize. It's to struggle. And, and so what, what Jesus is trying to say here is that the struggle for the kingdom of God does not allow for inaction or indecision or relaxation. It calls for an immediate, decisive action. Only those who press in can attain entrance. In putting it in other words, maybe, the cultivation of our Christian life is never a thing to be taken lightly. Did you hear what I just said? The cultivation of our, of our Christian life is never to be taken lightly. Uh, John Wesley referred to this as going on to perfection, or, you know, we call it sanctification. It's, you know, we, we, we accept Jesus Christ into our, our lives as Lord and Savior, but, then, but that's not the end. It's not a one-and-done deal. That's not it. Yeah, we have eternal salvation, but, but then Jesus wants us to conform to his mind, his will, God's will for our lives. And so that's what Jesus is talking about when he says work hard. He's, Strive for improvement in your life to become more and more and more like Christ. The second thing that strikes me about Jesus' answer to this question is that he does not necessarily emphasize how many, although it's certainly hinted in there when he says the gate is narrow and many will fail, but instead he emphasizes who. Who? The saved are the ones who seize the opportunity now. They grab a hold now. Many will try, but the door is narrow the window of opportunity is limited. I want you to really think about that for a minute. The door is narrow. These are Jesus' words, not mine. The door is narrow. The window of opportunity is limited. Repent, respond, and be recognized as part of the team. And so I want to, to think about this idea of being recognized or in the case what Jesus is talking about, unrecognized. And so that's the next thing. Unrecognized. Now these, again, Jesus' words. Then you will say, but we ate and drank with you, and you taught in our streets. And he will reply, I tell you, I don't know you or where you come from. Get away from me, all you who do evil. Now Jesus continues his answer to the question, will only a few be saved? Remember, that's, that's the leading question to this whole discussion. Will only a few be saved? Using what, us, you know, what theologians refer to as the via negativa. That's a really fancy word for saying they're looking at it from the negative point of view. Okay? The via negativa. That, that, there's your water cooler word for the day, Ken. You can use that and impress your friends. Um, probably not. Anyway, so instead of talking about those who make it in, Jesus speaks to those who will not. I suspect that these two lines were quite difficult to hear when Jesus first spoke them. I mean, he's got this whole entourage just following along with him. And all of a sudden, Jesus says this. <laughs> and they're kind of like, whoa. And I suspect that some of you are thinking, whoa, what does Jesus mean with this? And so I want to I put this in a little bit more modern-day vernacular that, that might be better to understand what Jesus is saying. So here's what he said. You ready for this? Familiarity with Jesus will be of no benefit. Familiarity of Jesus will be of no benefit. Knowledge of Jesus will be of no benefit. What? Wait, 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 What? Look at what Jesus purports these people are saying. He says that they would say, but we ate and we drank with you and you taught in our streets. So they're saying, we hung around Jesus. We were in the crowd. We were wonderful fans. We wore all the appropriate gear. I mean, here it is. We've got it all. We've got our what would Jesus do bumper sticker. We attended church every month or so when we had time. We watched our, our evangelists on TV every now and then. We even liked some posts about Jesus on Facebook. And to all of that, Jesus responds, 
I don't recognize you at all. You're not part of the team. Ouch. What is Jesus saying here, beloved? He wants us to know that it is not enough to just know about Jesus. Satan knows about Jesus. He even tried to tempt him on more than one occasion. The demons of hell know about Jesus. They're familiar with him. We must have an intimate relationship with him. To be on the team, we must have a relationship with the coach such that he will be able to distinguish us from the crowd of hang-around fans. Remember what we've said so many times before, it's not about religion. It's about relationship. I'm going to say something now that may offend some of you. I apologize if you're offended. But it's how I lived most of my life until I realized I was wrong. So I'm not preaching to anybody beyond myself. One of the great mistruths of our generation is the idea that because we grew up in a Christian nation, we grew up in a Christian home, a church, Sunday school, United Methodist Youth Fellowship, or whatever particular one you were a part of, that we therefore must be Christians because we grew up in all those things. I see someone shaking her head, no. That's beautiful, thank you for knowing ahead of time, sweetie. It's beautiful. This is not true. Eh, Wrong answer. In order to be a Christian, dear friends, you must have a personal relationship with Jesus. That's what makes you Christian. Not attending church. Although I hope and pray you will. Not going to UMYF, although I hope and pray you will. Personal relationship with Jesus is what makes you a Christian. I once heard a preacher say it this way. Just because you're standing in the garage, that doesn't make you a car. Just because you're swimming in the ocean, it doesn't make you a fish. Just because you attend church, yeah, So how do we know if we're a true Christian? I mean, maybe some of you are thinking that right now in your mind. Woo, Brother Don, what are you saying? How do we know? How do we know that we're part of the remnant that we've been talking about all these weeks, that I've I've proclaimed that we are a part of, this church is a part of the remnant? How do we know that? How do we know that we're on the team and that we're recognized by the coach? I think one of the best ways to know this is, is simply put, are the fruit of the Spirit evident in your life? Are the fruit of the Spirit evident in your life? Here's Paul talking to us about the fruit of the Spirit. You know, when when we ask Jesus to come be a part of our lives and we proclaim that he is Lord and Savior, we, we understand that the Holy Spirit comes to reside within you and becomes part of your life from that moment on. Do these fruit appear in your life. What are they? But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. There is no law against these things. Is this you? So What do we want you to do as a result of this sermon? We simply want you to do a self-examination. That's it. I want you to look at yourself. Are these fruit evident in your life? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And hear me, friends. Please hear me. 
give yourself some grace again (laughs) because these are not going to be evident in your life 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They're not in my life. They're not going to be in your life. Sometimes we'll get anxious. Sometimes we'll get angry. Sometimes we won't be the kindest person on the face of the earth. It happens. We're human. But they should be visible for the majority of your life, for the better part of your life. Do you see them? Be honest with yourself. If you don't see them enough, and that might be everybody in this room, including me, ask Jesus for help. Ask him for some help. Talking to him is one of the ways to build your relationship with him. You build your relationship with your spouse, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your best buddy, your BFF. How do you build a relationship with him? You spend time with him. Same thing with Jesus. Got to spend time with him. Another way to build the relationship is learn as much about him as possible through Bible study and life group and meditating on his word and devotionals. And and we already warned you, right? Learning about him isn't enough. I mean, it's really important. Don't get me wrong. Learning about him is very, very important. You can't know him if if you don't know anything about him. But you can't stop at the knowledge of him. You got to keep going. You got to learn to apply what you've learned about him in your daily living. You got to take the next step. You got to get in the game. You can't just be a fan up there wearing all of your garb. Friends, I don't know about you, but I want to be on the team. And I don't want to to just be in the stands as a fan. I want to be on the field and in the game. I want the coach. I want Jesus to recognize me when I walk up to him. And I think you do too. So let's be part of the few who respond and get in the game. So I I don't do this very often, but I'm going to have an altar call today. If you have not asked Jesus into your life yet, but you would like to do so today, if you want to make him Lord and Savior today, here's the altar. You can walk all the way up to the top if you want and kneel and pray by the altar. You can come over here to the side rail and kneel and pray. You can come up here. You can come lay on the, on the floor if you want, if that's what you think you need to do. Come and pray. If you want someone to pray with you, any of the pastoral staff, Miss Jackie, we're up here for you. I've got some prayer warriors. They'll pray with you too. If you would simply like more evidence of the fruit of the Spirit in your life. You, you, you know that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, but you know your struggle every day to, to have that fruit of the Spirit in your life, to be patient, to be kind, to be loving, to be faithful. If you struggle with that every day, I encourage you to come on up here and pray as well. Again, the whole altar is available to you. Come on up here. If you want someone to pray with you, just signal. Tell them, come on. Pastor Ron will pray with you. Pastor Jake will pray. Christina, myself, Miss Jackie. You want someone to pray with you, just call for us. We'll come get you. Get down on your knees and pray. Get down on the floor and pray if you need to. Get in the game. Don't be just a fan. We've got so much more to give to this world if we were just in the game. God calls us, but only a few of us respond. Will you respond today? I encourage you, come kneel, come pray if you'd like. One more week in this sermon series. Come and pray. Ron, come lead us.
it is a time for prayer. This place that we're in is supposed to be a house of prayer. And so um, our boldness in coming to God has been provided for by Jesus. And I trust that we'd take advantage of that. I'll share with you the two prayer cards that we have this uh, Sunday. One is from uh, Audrey Rowe, who has been asking for prayer for his son. His name is Brad. He's down in Florida. He, he's been in intensive care. He got out last night, but he's still in the hospital. He still has a long way to go to recover from his illness. Our prayers are coveted for him. And this prayer card is from... Uh, from Mary Calder saying, praise God, Hank is doing better. That is very good news. We're grateful to hear that. Thank you, uh, Pathfinder family, for prayers, for texts, for cards. She says, family love and support is priceless. And you got it. Thank you for the Valentine cards. Thank you, uh, Lori Dahlman, for delivering them. She says they brought a smile to their faces and uh, a hug to our hearts. All the glory goes to God. Amen. It's true. So um, our prayers for Hank continues. One moment. I want to pray for you and with you. You can come up here and pray, and we encourage that. But I was taken by the thought that uh, Don spoke about the the door of opportunity and how we tend to kind of think that those windows, those doors of opportunity just are kind of always there and, and yet if we're honest we know that in our life those spaces of opportunity yes they open but they also close and they always close unexpectedly and we're sometimes surprised Don't miss the window. Don't miss that, that opportunity when God gives it to you. I'll suggest to you that uh, one of the tests that you can apply is to check for your pulse. And if you have your pulse with you today, the opportunity is still there for you to uh, make some decisions for Jesus. But you also know the pulse is a fragile thing, and we should never take it for granted. Let's pray, shall we? This living of our life, oh God, is a serious business. We, we are thankful that many, many of the moments and the days and the seasons of our life are, are just filled with... Um, <laughs> wonderful happiness, great excitement, and all the energy of life. Thank you, God, for overwhelming us with those good moments. But, Lord, we have, most of us have lived long enough to recognize that there are some moments of change, that circumstances are suddenly altered, that the unexpected, the unanticipated, the unplanned for suddenly becomes what we deal with. In all kinds of different ways, suddenly life is brought into question. And we want to know, where do we stand? Where's our foundation? Where's our hope? What will get me through this? How will I cope? And I thank you, God, that your Holy Spirit is present and that our relationship with Jesus is a living reality that your Spirit dwells in us and that Jesus never fails us. So whatever the struggle, whatever the change, whatever the, the, the fear, we know where our hope is found. And God, I pray that each and every one that ever is listening and hearing these words chooses carefully, chooses wisely that which lasts for eternity and never buys an imitation 
that does not last at all. We lift up to you the life that is this church, that, oh God, we would be a part of your family's kingdom work, that we would not uh, be uh, confused about who is our Savior and where is our hope, that we would speak clearly your truth. We give you thanks for the way in which you answer prayers in the lives of people. We commit to you the people that we know that you put on our hearts that we would be praying indeed. So hear our prayers, O God, because Jesus has provided the way. He is our truth. He is our hope. He is our Savior. We pray it in his name. Amen. Let's all stand up and sing together as we close this worship service. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory.
Thanks for worshiping with us today. Receive this blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God the Father, and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's people said, amen. Have a great week.